Hello, everybody. Welcome to Strategy in Future. My name is Jacek Bartosiak, and today with me is Albert Świdziński again. We are about to continue our new series uh, titled Turmoil in, uh, in the World. Uh, this time it's part two. We record part one uh, that stirred up uh, great interest on social media and on YouTube. Thank you for all that. Uh, today we'll be continuing, and I think we'll be continuing with more and more chapters, with more and more episodes uh, to come, uh, trying to dive deeper and deeper. Uh, let me start uh, uh, episode two of our conversations of our series by um, uh, try, you know, by, by, with an attempt to challenge the common wisdom that is in the West. And uh, I'm not going to say that I, I sort of share this worldview as I will present how the Russians are thinking these days, but uh, in a con for the content from the context and especially for what I'm going to ask you, Albert, about the uh, structural forces across Eurasia, uh, this will be a starting point. Okay. So first of all, of course, I will be generalizing a little bit, but that gives you the impression of really what they think is that the um, they claim that the the uh, the percentage of GDP that they represent uh, in statistics is not reflecting the real power that they have, because first of all they claim that it's it's based not on the uh, you know PPP uh, measure but rather on a nominal value, which is quite different, uh, quite different story. Plus the um, you know the West, broadly speaking, West is calculating the services as something that is equal in importance to production and raw materials and food and stuff, while the Russians don't accept this kind of approach. Uh, simply, they, they claim that they produce food. They are you know major producer of wheat and other food elements, and they produce raw materials. And the service uh, sector does not exist without raw materials <laughs> And the food. This is how they view the world. Plus, they they view the world as the uh, being run by the United States, uh, that is, and and the rest of the Western countries that, with an exception of the United States, do not have raw materials, and uh, they do not uh, run proper economies. So Eurasia is revolting against them, uh, and basically with this in mind, and with the structure of the world having changed, as they claimed, they issued ultima ultimatum. They issued the demands in December 2021 by the, by the Foreign Ministry of Russian Federation, Wavrov, who demanded the withdrawal of the NATO installations and forces behind the Oder River, you know, meaning west of uh, Poland, trying to restore this concept of the sphere of influence. Of course, this uh, this was challenged by the United States, and now we are having war. So it was in a nutshell, the sort of the, uh, the perspective that the Russians are, are having. What would you say about that, Alvin? Well, th there are a couple of comments because, uh, look, there are two things. First of all, you could I, I listened with great care to uh, Putin's speech at Valde Club, and I think it revealed a couple of very interesting idiosyncrasies of his. And again, I, I think it's safe to say that we believe that ultimately, at the, at the end of the day, it isn't really leaders that shape reality; it's the reality, the structural limitations that shape the leaders, right? And they're freedom of maneuver, which is usually very limited, right? Yeah. So when you look at Putin's decision uh, to launch this offensive campaign, uh, to launch the largest war in Europe, you could see, uh, well, you could see how structurally it made sense to an extent, right? He was correct in his assessment that the U.S. power is diminishing relatively. He was correct in his assessment of how deeply the Western European economy, some German economy in particular, is, is reliant on uh, the hydrocarbons, right, coming from from Russia. He uh, he probably had assessments regarding how the Ukraine's will to fight. So there is that. So structurally, 
there were arguments to, to, to make the call he made. At the same time, if you listen to his, uh, to his speech at Valda, you could see how his particular worldview really affected this decision, right? Because basically what he said is that the West is frail and it's, uh, it's dominance. It's, he referred a lot to colonial past of the Western states, forgetting the glorious colonial past of Russia as well, right? And countless, countless nations that, that you know, fell under the boot of the, of the Russians. But you could see that he made an assessment that the West is basically rotten through and through. And the order that the West has created, the US really effectively has created, is rotten through and through. And all you need to, to take it down is to give it a solid kick and it's going to fall fall apart. And he presumably thought that his decision to be uh, in, the, in the avant-garde of this will give Russia first mover advantage. So... What he did, essentially, again, what you mentioned, is he demanded, essentially, Russia has demanded the right to have a sphere of influence, to claim a sphere of influence of its own, right? And again, this is a notion that runs very parallel to how the world is organized right now, not because of some moral or, or you know, value-based considerations, but simply because the U.S. dominance, the hegemony, cannot afford to, to, to uh, can, cannot afford to, to grant sphere of influence to anyone. This is the big difference, by the way, between what's happening now and what was happening during the Cold War, right? This was the 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 big stopgap for any larger conflicts that, that the US never never disputed the Soviet right to have a sphere of influence. And the Czechoslovak found out Czechoslovaks found out the hard way, right? The Hungarians found out the hard way. Now the US is not willing to grant a sphere of influence to China in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, and it was not willing to grant a sphere of influence of its own to Russia. And I can understand why, especially in, in Europe, uh, this was unacceptable for the US, um, because essentially allowing this to Russia would permit Russia a permanent place, I say, uh, in, in the security architecture in Europe, right? This is what it effectively that would mean. It would pave way to a uh, concert of powers in Europe, essentially, uh, by uh, neutralizing uh, Limitrov, so to speak, the the you know turbulent Perfect. yeah the per the Russian periphery. The periphery yeah. But the thing is, if the U.S. would accept that, it would really leave no place for Europe for, for, for the further U.S. presence in Europe. There would be no need for it because, again, the Western Europeans do not really need the U.S. military presence. It's helpful. It helps to limit the expenditures in military, but it's not structurally needed. And in many ways, it runs, runs counter to the interests of Germans or the French. So yeah, this is what Vladimir Putin did. He demanded a sphere of influence. That was not granted. And it's very interesting what happened. If I, if I may, final point. Uh, to really segue us into other things. It's very interesting how the US played this whole this whole situation. There were three very distinctive behaviors by the US that happened in the in the build up to to the war. And the first of them was that the US refused to appease. There was there was no Munich 38 when it comes to the US actions. Um the US refused. The US was willing to to discuss a number of the demands laid out by Russia, but not all of them. And as as Lavro pointed out, it was not a la carte; it was to be taken altogether. So there was a there was no appeasement. At the same time, U.S. failed to deter. There was an abject deterrence failure on the behalf of the U.S. Um, the U.S. was not willing to do things that would have to be done to effectively deter Russia from attacking Ukraine, and it could have done so at the significant risk of the conflict still happening, but it could have done so, right? It could have gave Ukraine ironclad security guarantees. It could have stationed at least nominal tripwire forces in Ukraine. It could have done a number of things. It could have sent Ukraine the hardware it needed to effectively defend itself prior to the onset of the war. It didn't do that. So there was an abject deterrence failure. The third thing that happened and was unparalleled, I think, in, in the U.S. history, was the degree to which the U.S. was transparent about the intentions of Russia and what the U.S. knows about it, right? I'm sure you remember we spoke about this multiple yeah. times ago. 
The U.S. never used to share intelligence the way it shared intelligence, not just with its allies, but also with the public. World public. Never happened before. Mm -hmm. And effectively, in a way, it uh, it proclaimed urbi et orbi that Putin will do this, that he's serious about it, and he's gonna he's gonna you know he's gonna have a go at it. So those three things created a particular environment within which Russia had to navigate. And so the war began. Let me let me stop here. Yeah, the the the, the war began, and um, the Russians uh, simply wanted to have a say uh, in the affairs of the continent. Uh, the problem is that the Germans and the French were ready, more or less, to accept this. The problem was that the acceptance of it would trample the United States' position on the continent, NATO expansion, you know, NATO enlargement that has happened over the many years since the breakup of the Soviet Union. And most importantly, for the two guys talking to you now, that would completely uh, annihilate or intimidate the, our self-agency here in the region, in the Intermarium, in Poland and other countries of the region, where our agency, where our political decision-making would be completely subject subjected to the Russian foreign policy. And that was basically the demand. And that is the consequence and the outcome of uh, accepting the Russian demands in this ultimatum that I mentioned 10 minutes ago. And uh, because that, that would also annihilate two, two most important principles of Poland's grand strategy. Principle number one, to keep Russia out of the European system of power. And that has been successful for most of the 500 years since the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And second, equalizing the uh, economic gap between Poland, France, and, and Germany. We think here in Warsaw that accepting and giving in to the Russian demands would create the situation that, first of all, our security would be dependent upon the Russians. Our decision-making in the consequence would be trampled but also our economic progress would be highly reliant upon the decision-making of powers above our heads. Uh, and that, and basically the war is all about this. And of course, Ukrainians also said no, and they defeated the Russian forces at the gates of Kiev. And that, and, and that you know, triggers another point of our discussion. So... It turned out, and we were monitoring it at Strategy and Future, that the Russian great military reforms that started like more than 10 years ago with Serdyukov and Shoigu produced, to say mixed results would be, you know, uh, euphemism. Um, uh, bad results for the great war that is required to seize and defeat Ukraine, which is a huge country. So Russians apparently destroyed their mass mobilization system that had been with them since the you know the consequences of the Crimean War in the 19th century, yeah, and that put them through uh, the first and the second world war and was with the Soviets, and it, and was demolished first in the 90s of the 20th century and finally because of the lack of resources and you know apparent vision that there would not be a major war in the periphery. And for limited wars with uh, smaller, uh, you know, and less powerful countries, the Russians will, would need the mass mobilization concept of the slow mobilization process and a lot of conscripts, which is very expensive, uh, you know, but it, it's not agile. It's not quick to react. And the Russians suffer in the Chechen wars, uh, you know, from this uh, shortage of quickness and, and a quick effect on the battlefield. So this time around, they wanted to create the force. But this for force turned out to be too small without sufficient logistics and, and with many other failures and uh, shortcomings that uh, became apparent during the war. But I, I think we will separately talk about the uh, battlefield, the warfare, uh, what the war in Ukraine revealed in terms of the Russian military power and prowess. We will, we will talk about it maybe later maybe in another episode, but coming back to, you know, to, 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 to the continental consolidation. 
And why did the Russians wanted to start this war or at least intimidate Ukraine in the first place? I personally think, I'm not sure if you agree with me, Albert, that they wanted, I actually, they wanted to have this sort of the political cohesion with the Western Europeans, because Russians feel that they are a part of Europe, to create this, you know, trans-Eurasian partnership from Vladivostok to Lisbon, Lisbon in Portugal, over the, the dead agency of the intermarium countries. The US, really and the US. And the US, but they didn't want to be part of China, or they didn't want to be yeah. a vassal of China. They preferred being part of the European system that would be expanded. But this as, is... as a great power, as a buffer zone between China, and China as a major player in the northern northern Eurasia, as a, even a military power projection power for the Western Europeans. And in order to achieve this, they had to get rid of the United States influence on the continent. And of course, they wanted they, they had to intimidate the neighbors. And, and Ukraine, this is uh... And this is where uh, really West Midland sequencing strategy comes into play and how he laid it out, the, the necessity of stopping Russian expansion in the West. But before I get into this, let me just uh, briefly summarize how we see how Russia portrays itself and views itself vis-a-vis -vis the broader international order in Europe or the broader balance of power. Because essentially at the end of the day, what Russia lacks is a pull factor. It in spite of what people, the, the people that love, and I'm one of them, love Primsky, Korsakov, and Tchaikovsky, and and you know, and so on and so forth, Russia doesn't really uh, doesn't really have the pull factor that the U.S. has, or even the Western European states have. It it bases uh, how to put it. It, it basically portrays itself itself as a necessary force for stabilizing the security architecture in the continent, right? It it operates in two modes. If it's a part of a broader security architecture, it's a stabilizing force that prevents, you know, not only centrifugal forces that threaten it, but uh, pacifies, for example, restless nations, the nations of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so if it's a part of the security architecture, it stabilizes its, its periphery, right? If it's outside of the international order, like it was, for example, during the interbellum period in the 20th century. Uh, it presents itself as a destabilizing force. So this is the two modes within which it basically operates, mm -hmm. right? And the situation where Russia is outside is out the door, so to speak. You 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 call the Ukraine as a revolving door that uh, could either keep Russia outside of the international system, security architecture in Europe, or if it's flipped, then Russia is firmly on the inside. We used to play that role before as well. It's a very nasty role to play, as you could easily tell once you look at Bakhmut and places like that. It's a, it's a very difficult role to play. Yeah. So if Russia is outside, there is a space for our agency. For the for, for agency of the states of the intermarium, right? From the Baltic to the Black Sea, for Ukraine's, Poland's, Lithuania's, Belarus's of this world. If Russia's in, the system becomes stable in many ways. Like it was stable during the uh the Belle Epoque, right? Or the you know Yeah, after the Congress of Vienna, yeah, after the Congress the of Vienna, Vienna wars, with Maybe. the Russia as a stabilizer and then of course with all those countries from the uh, from between Germany and Russia gone from the, uh, the political system of Europe precisely but and again I'm going to go back to Putin at Valdai club when he because basically what he said was a one big jacques letter sort of like Tola wrote except for he that the jacques was directed not at the french military elite or whatever it was directed at the west but in particular it was directed at the united states uh, Putin openly, Putin openly stated that, you know, he doesn't really see Western Europeans as having agency, and rather they were like an accessory to the U.S. power. So one country he did not make an offer to was the U.S. in his speech. There was no middle ground, no ground for cooperation with the U.S. There was grounds for cooperation with the Germans and the French, and he again, he said it out loud that if the Europeans come back to their senses and start thinking rationally with, with economic calculations in mind, then we can make it work again. That's basically what he said. He, he said it regarding, uh, for example, Western European investments in, in, in Russia. 
that you know they were forced to give them away or to sell them away, but they are hopeful that they will come back to Western European previous owners of those. <laughs> Basically, what he was positing, and I think it makes perfect sense, and it goes back to what we spoke the last time. Without Russian hydrocarbons, the much of the, for example, the German economic model collapses, and there is not a good way to bring it back. Um, the Germans might hope for LNG, but LNG is going to be pricey in years to come, especially when Asia comes back to life and China ends its lockdowns, which it inevitably will. And there are, you know, it's a peculiar market. It's nowhere near as safe and stable as getting gas, natural gas from gas from Russia. So, and you, you saw this in the first days of the war that Germans were, were and Zelensky said out loud in his in his piece in Washington Post. Uh, that he had a feeling that many of the Western officials were just hoping that they were going to roll over and give up quickly. Well, they didn't give up. They didn't roll over. The Ukrainians, the poorest country per capita GDP, stopped Russia and its tracks in Kiev. It was closed, but they did. And then it's Humpty Dumpty kind of, kind of deal. You know, the, the old order cannot be feasibly brought back to life even though germans really hope so and they still do hope that and why do they hope that that's fairly understandable again at the price of neutralizing ambitions of ukraine and all those other you know uh, ephemeral nations so to speak ironically to an extent the germans could hope to create an economic system that would spread from lisbon to vladivostok as the famous you know famous adage went uh, with the technologically advanced and you know high profit industrialized mar industrial margin production of the Western Europeans, with the cheap hydrocarbons and raw resources of Russia, potentially a place where we can outsource the nasty production, you know, the polluting production, and the huge market that China has, and a huge you know uh, industrial capacity that China has, and that's a very good system, objectively speaking. So. In this situation, you can under now to go back to Wes Mitchell and his sequencing argument. If I may, I don't know if I'm, if I'm straying too far off topic, but maybe I'll just quickly present the, the view Wes Mitchell uh, laid yeah, out okay, first. Go ahead. To, 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 to probably ONA at the Pentagon and ONA, published yeah, at yeah. National Interest. Yeah. And, uh, it was published at, uh, at August Martin, 2021, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And Martin, then he yeah. also, yeah, and the, but then he also uh, laid it out very eloquently and elegantly in, uh, in national interest. And basically what he said is, you know, drawing back the, the, the whole marathon initiative piece was how empires manage to uh, concurrent threats from great powers, right? And he pointed out a number of, usually you cannot take them both at the same time. This is just the physics, the, how the world is. You, you rarely ever have enough power to, to take head on to, to symmetrical threats. So you usually have to sequence your opponents, right? There are many different ways to do it. You can uh, focus on uh, the weaker opponent by deferring the competition with the stronger one. You could focus on the stronger one while deferring the competition with the weaker one. This is and in in this particular context of Russia, China, and the US, that strategy would mean a sort of Yalta 2.0 and sort of creating a modus operandi, modus vivendi with Russia and trying to pull it away from China, which I think was a, an idea that had some some supporters in, in the DC. But this this option is not possible because again, there is nothing that the US can offer to Russia that would that could really offset the potential benefits of having this nice arrangement between the European Peninsula, Russia as a joint between it, and then the, the, the East Asia on the other side, right? There is nothing that the US can give to Russians. In the same way that there isn't really nothing that the US can give to the Germans to offset this potentiality, right? It's a, it's a great, great thing to have. We can only compel them to do it. Or you can only compel them. By creating the conditions, macro macroeconomic conditions yeah. that would be killing for Germans, like you know, no ocean faring, no raw materials. You can from... try that, but that's you know that's very that's very escalatory. <laughs> to say. So yeah, this is like... that's why it's gonna be tough, yeah, for the US. That's why it's gonna be tough for the US. And, so, and so just this... for, for the listeners to remind to remember, we are seated in Warsaw and we are much in favor of you yeah. know defeating Russians and, and killing this uh, continental consolidation project. 
but still we are you know we have the duty to 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 sort of describe those forces structural we're forces we're worried about gaps in u.s strategic thinking so to speak uh, i know it might sound outrageous coming from a peripheral country but it is what it is there are gaps in, in the u.s strategy the, so the, the, there is no savvy grand strategy proposed with a detailed execution plan for the allies, why the allies should bend the wagon with the United States in this new a game theory of victory either. where trade and technology is at stake, as opposed okay. to the Cold War, where the Soviets were only threatening with military power, which was in doubt anyway. It's a right. completely different territory these days when with China trying to play the key role in the you know in the economic domain of the future. That is correct. So if, if I could just wrap up the, the, the thought that West Mitchell presented. So again, you cannot really defer competition of the weaker of the two in favor of dealing with, with, with the stronger one. You can't really go the other way around because the things with China went too far. So that's and you know showing weakness or showing uh, being willing to accommodate Russia could embolden China. The most elegant solution would be to co-opt both and make them understand that the current order self serves their interests well. But that's also out of window. That's not happening either. So what Mitchell laid out and proposed in his uh, national interest piece was to basically do a variation, so to speak, of uh, the sequencing strategy where you realize you cannot give Russia what it wants in the West. This is unacceptable. You cannot do it. So you have to put a hard stop to any and all Russian uh, expansionist ambitions in the West, break the, make them break their teeth. On Ukraine, uh, West Metro specifically mentioned Ukraine. And then once Russia realizes that that's out of window, then the only, you know, the only viable direction to which they could, you know, channel their, their energy, so to speak, becomes Far East, becomes Siberia, where their ambitions would come and clash in conflict with China. China. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the Japanese have a lot of money laying around. The U.S. has some money laying around. You could offer incentives for Russia to try to develop those traditionally underdeveloped regions, bring it in a conflict with China, creating a, a sort of a difference, you know, a, a sort of a discord in their relations. And I think this is what happened. I think this is what happened, except for things went, went better than everybody expected. Because every, I think the baseline scenario in D.C., I really believe so, the baseline scenario in D.C. was Afghanistan. That Ukraine will fall, that Zelensky will take the offer to, to have a lift, as he put it in there on the 24th or 25th, 24th at night before the war started, he was supposed to be expelled from Kiev, probably to Warsaw, where he would uh, try to pretend a government, uh, try to pretend, uh, uh, create a government in exile, which is exercise in futility. But he would do that, and then Poland would become a staging area to support the insurgency. And, the West part I, of it. I'm very, very skeptical of that would work because one thing, Russians, they, they might suck at warfare or might not be as good as we thought. But I'm sure one thing they're excellent at, at is coin operations, counterinsurgency. They are great at destroying the elites. We, we felt it on our own bodies a lot over the past 200 years. A lot. We, we saw how good they are in eliminating the old elites and then replacing them with the right ones, the new ones. And destroying the resistance, we really we we suffered a lot from this, as everybody else in this in this part of the world. Yeah. So it went better than expected, but the game is still far from over, and you could still see how badly the French and the Germans are still angling, even though they would never say it out loud. But they still angle for some sort of status quo to develop, and this is where our interests as Poles and as Intermarium, the people of the Intermarium and the U.S. are very tightly aligned. And also, this is a thing that I'm really, I don't think I'm trying to, to lie to myself or try to do what Eastern Europeans often do when they speak with the Americans, that is convince them that they are more important than the Americans think. I, because it comes from both me and the Atsik, I think it's fair to say, especially as I know that I went through this and I changed my mind. I don't know how Yatsik looks at it, but... In the past, I'm sure we both agreed that we recognize that the U.S. has to prioritize Western Pacific. And it has to, you know, the, the, the economic center of the world is there already. The true military challenge is there already. 
So it only makes sense that the U.S. prioritizes that place, that's offshore balancing in Eastern Europe, and that's over the horizon presence, only provides us with enablers. Our new model army concept was based on that premise, that we can have, have, you know, we can stand our own ground. The model army that we envisaged and, you know, sort of crafted that strategy in the future. Prior and to presented the in D.C. Uh, days before the war began. Uh, but I changed my mind. I really think, especially if you look how badly Germans are uh, are angling to go back to how things were and how unwilling they are to break with China. And again, I understand them fully. They cannot break with China because that would mean they will the, the, the standards of living will drop very significantly. They cannot do this. The French don't want to do it either. They never did. If you read the goal statements and you know speeches. They dislike the idea of the U.S. being primus inter pares over here, and they always will. So, but once you see that, and once you see how dangerous the idea is, you know, and let's go to Martin there, how dangerous it is for any single force, and Cannon, and everybody else, how dangerous it is to have a singular force uh, dominate Eurasia, I really don't think the U.S. has the luxury of truly prioritizing one theater over the other. They need to, they need to handle both. And the question is whether they have resources to handle both. Of course, when we talk to the American strategies, strategy in the future, they claim that it's not a matter of capacity, it's a matter of policy choices. You know, of course, what else can they say to the allies that are, you know, reliant upon their military power projection far away from the United States CONUS, meaning the continent? But still, you know, they need to 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 explain to us how their capacity can handle both China and Russia, uh, and you know, and of course the uh, sort of uh, thinning out of the Russian land forces by the Ukrainians, equipped with with the uh, with the American uh, equipment uh, weaponry, uh, is helping them achieve this goal. And of course, that suits Poland's interests as well, perfectly well. So this is the um, this is the, the the perspective that we are having here. Uh, but still, <clears throat> the United States is, uh, is in badly needs the sound both military strategy that would explain how they want to handle both uh, theaters and uh, reassure the allies that are vulnerable. In both in the Western Pacific and here, at the same time, more transforming the U.S. Mil military towards the uh, the force of the future, which is more offshore, offshoreish, and more, you know, from over the horizon, but still effective enough to appease, not to appease. I'm sorry, to reassure the allies, and of course, the the, the second segment, and maybe most more important. Of the sound strategy that the Americans should present to the Allies in the rimland of Eurasia, landmass, and the islands around Eurasia, which are usually the American allies of the Second World War, is to sort of provide the economic solutions for decoupling. If the United States were to be persistent, uh, you know, as 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 regards decoupling from China. And decoupling the supply, the globalized supply chains, then the allies that are making money on Chinese work need to be provided with the alternative. And so, in a detailed fashion, so to speak. Uh, and so far, we haven't seen this kind of a scenario. Instead, uh, you know, in fact, we are seeing. The more and more protectionist uh, uh, regulations uh, in the U.S. Congress that is uh, that are uh, you know uh, sort of aimed to increase the uh, competitiveness of the American industry and even yeah. uh, and even create the conditions for bringing the uh, the European industry uh, towards the United States economy. I'm thinking about this, and that's a very new new thought, really, because this is this is what we spoke about the last time we we had our podcast, right? The Eurasian turmoil, uh, and basically it boiled down to two things: one of inflation, one was Inflation Reduction Act and subsidies that you know were granted to U.S. companies or North American 
manufacturers and not Europeans, and the other one was export controls and microchips to China. Yeah. Mm, both of which irked greatly the Europeans, the Western Europeans. With that being said, and this is worrisome as an example of strategy, unless the US would be very willing to venture to Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Without it, it's a very short-sighted strategy because there is no way the Western Europeans are going to go for it. The Germans will never agree. So in that sense, it's a very bad idea. At the same time, from Polish perspective, we're looking at Polish perspective. If the U.S. would make this strategy sound, at the end of the day, we would remain in the position and value chains that we are now. That is semi-peripheral to the German economy, which yeah. has been the, the objective of many chancellors in the past. Better yeah. or worse. <laughs> yeah, you but, know, of course, you'd be using the, the, the matrix of Wallerstein yeah, and his concept of the uh, yes. and you know, and so on. But, and, but uh, I think that's reality here. Mm -hmm. Politico ran a very interesting article a day ago, I think, in their playbook thingy. I don't know if I should uh, product place, but hey. So basically, they pointed out that 80% of the money that was uh, handed out in this uh, post-pandemic recovery planning, 80% of it, Jacek, it went to two countries. Do you know which countries they were? I'm sure. <laughs> you know, it, it, guess. Give it a guess. No, no, no. I don't it know. was Germany and France. 80% oh. of the money went over there yeah of course and of course the the western europeans will try to to protect their industries at the cost of the periphery so probably the eu united uh, european union will be tested heavily big time this oh, yeah. this time around in 2023 but still the question arises and as you know many americans when talk talking to us they claim that the western europeans have no maneuvering space Sooner or later, they will be intimidated by the U.S. Uh, leverage and they will, you know, maybe not happily, but politely follow the suit uh, as they will have no other choice. This if was not for them. sure on the minds uh, of the Champs-Élysées in, in Paris, uh, for sure prior to the war and the opening months of the war. I don't know now, uh, you know... Uh, the Russians, of course, are, are are sort of teasing the Germans that the Americans are making a lot of money on on the natural gas and on food, while the uh, the Western Europeans have no, uh, you know, they they simply not only don't they make money, but they are efficient. Europeans say themselves, Jacek, Michel, everybody, they say that the U.S. is profiteering, <laughs> you know, yeah. which it is. Yeah, which 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 shows that this is still a long game to play. Yeah. Both in terms but, of Russia, but also in trying to create the allied camp of the democracies that would be confronting China. And by confronting, Americans mean decoupling from the Chinese economy and uh, for sure from the main domains of the future, like quantum computing, AI, others. And that's a tough call. That's a tough call in Eurasia. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a really yeah, tough call. Possible. It's Maybe not for Poles. We would happily join this effort. We are not a major trading country. And if we trade, it's going to usually go via Germany. But for Germans and for France, this is, I mean, this so is a break, breakup of the social yeah. country. This, this might sound like an overly enthusiastic sales pitch for Central Eastern Europe. But look, even if it goes down to, say, and we're, we're, we're really running away far into the future, but if it comes to a... Ukraine winning this war. Let's disregard the definition of victory though for a second. But if it, even if Ukraine comes to victory, comes to, the war comes to an end with you know desirable result. If it's the Germans rebuilding the country, it will not really serve the U.S. well at the end of the day, to, because the Germans again will angle for strategic sovereignty of European Peninsula. So if you wanna, if you're looking to make it a working strategy, especially that you cannot really, you cannot really have intermarium states, whether Ukraine, Poland, or, and other states in whatever configuration, you cannot have those, those places that are just simply militarily powerful, but without a significant economic <laughs> because this will just won't hold, right? This, 
yeah. is on hold, and this will sooner rather than later again subject this region to a degree of control from the Western Europeans, from all the Europe. Yeah. So, if you want to make this project viable of a of a uh, again a cordon sanitaire, so to speak, not just for Russia but for Eurasia, yeah. you have to make sure that there is a degree of economic strength over here. So whatever, if you want to make it work, whatever offer the U.S. should make to Western Europeans, a part of it should be outsourced to Eastern Europeans to make them viable economically, to stand up on their own. Yeah. And then, you know, yeah. like, like South Koreans of this world, right? Like early Marshall Plan. Yeah. And of course, the, the tricky thing is that the, uh, a lot of American establishment is, is still treating Germany as a pivotal point in, in, in their grand strategy of Europe providing strategic depth and, and geography and, of course, technology, money, and so on. And, and But still, the Germans are playing the continental column. So, of course, the, the Polish government would like to replace Germans as a main player for the American power projection and, you know, this allied uh, effort. And, and this is why we are trying to reform our military to create a, you know, a, a completely new brand, high-quality land force in Europe, probably the biggest and most, most sizable across the continent, uh, investing a lot of money and trying to, in this way, to sort of uh, <laughs> entangle or not entangle, uh, sort of the uh, string the, the United States to us, yeah, so that the, uh, we could fill in the, you know, the, the the vacuum where the United States doesn't want to be heavily present on the on the soil, and we will provide those capabilities maybe together with the Ukrainians. So that's a concept, and, and, and by that, not having industry and not having the BMWs and so on, we will sort of uh, fill in this vacuum that the Germans have left. Uh, and of course, we are looking carefully at uh, how DC, Washington DC, is viewing this. Uh, still, I think the, the the case is still unresolved. Uh, although I'm I'm highly doubtful whether. By simply raise, you know, increasing the numbers and investing in the hardware, will really make this impression on the United States. At strategy in the future, we've been of the, of the opinion that it's more of the new model army showing the uh, strategic competence and understanding the challenges the United States is facing, plus the evolution of the battlefield towards the precision battlefield and you know C two, C four, C five, and you know situation awareness information dominance based warfare would put Poland in a position to be a sort of a junior partner but a partner to the United States and that would change our status as opposed to you know to just increasing the numbers and stuff but this is another topic maybe we'll raise it separately as well uh, so that we could you know uh, explain to our viewers how we see the modernization of the Polish force uh, and not just as a sort of imitation of something and not a you know legacy force with huge numbers, but something that would uh, provide the active defense uh, with some offensive elements and the uh, strike reconnaissance complex on our own and so on, because otherwise it doesn't make sense at all. And, and this new strategic situation in, in this part of the world is sort of compelling us to do so, and that also calls... Uh, Tough questions on the alliance, NATO, all this, you know, deterrence by punishment or by denial. We will touch all those issues. I'm just just signalizing. I'm just hinting we're going to touch those issues so that our viewers couldn't wait to see another episode of ours. Yeah. We have a difficult conversation coming up on extended nuclear deterrence as well. No doubt about that. Yeah. yeah. But plenty I, of that to come. Exactly. We will talk about the how to how to convince our American allies to really make sure that their credibility and their nuclear guarantees are really solid and not only reassuring, but solid to the extent that the Russians will not try to test them yeah, at our cost. So that's another part of the story and Albert will present also it's our- I think the president, the goal and President Park could never be convinced of, but we'll get back to that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So maybe that's a good moment to pause for a while until we, you know, we were having another episode. Thank you, Albert, for the you know very interesting conversation and uh, looking forward to to having another one shortly. And thank you, uh, 
you know, thanks to our viewers for, you know, being with us. Stay with us at Strategy in Future. Albert Świdziński, Jacek Bartosiak.